Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Jack Haynes, Deputy Editor of MBY, and I'm joined as usual by Editor Hugo and Nick Burnham, who is our uh, contributor, regular contributor, and also the man behind the Aquaholic YouTube channel. Welcome, guys. How are you both doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Jolly good. Um, the first thing I want to do, because this is the first one of these we've filmed uh, since we hit the 100,000 subscriber mark, is thank you all. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for the support. We we really appreciate it. It's a milestone we're very proud of, and hopefully it'll give us a platform to, to produce more of the content that you enjoy. So um, thank you very much, and then there's plenty more coming along the way, so, so please do keep watching. Um, Guys, the first thing I'd like to do is we're about to go into a new season of boating. Hopefully things are opening up a wee bit here in the UK. Um, where are your boats? Um, what have you got planned for them? Uh, and what are you thinking about doing this summer once we hopefully can get back to a bit of normality? Uh, Hugo, why don't you start? Well, I'm hoping that my boat is down in pool, but to be honest, I haven't seen it so long for so long. <laughs> I wasn't entirely confident it's still there, but in theory, it is currently in a shed on a trailer uh, down in sandbanks in pool um and that lives in the summer it, it lives on a swing mooring in pool harbor just off sandbanks so i sort of paddle out to it in a little dinghy or a tender of some kind um i keep it down there really to be honest because because i always have i've i sort of grown up uh, around there and been there for years and still can't get enough of it it's such a great place for day boating you know you can explore the harbour you can go out of the harbour to Studland Bay although that's a bit of a controversial one at the moment because there's question marks over whether we're going to be allowed to carry on anchoring there but uh, it's just I love boating in the UK and and it suits me so well down there. And for those who don't know just just remind everybody what boat it is you've got. Yeah it's a it's called a Carnic it's a Carnic 2250 so it's uh, an open walk around uh, sort of sports fisher style boat um, with a little cuddy cabin in the middle, walk around decks, 200 horsepower Suzuki outboard engine. Um, and it's built in Cyprus of all places. It's not, not the best known of boats, um, but it's really practical. There's a big cockpit, plenty of outdoor space, which is what I want. I actually share it with uh, three of my brothers. Um, so we just need a big day boat that we can get all our kids on or a load of us on, on board for the day. Can overnight in it if you want to. But again, nice, simple, easy to look after, practical, 22 and a half feet, big enough for, for everything we want to do, but not so small that it's uh, sort of dangerous or uncomfortable if it chops up a bit. And when do you think you have it in the water? When do you usually put it in? Well, it, a little bit hard to know this year. I normally tend to put it in, to be honest, not really till around sort of April, May at the earliest, mm. um, because I just don't get, get down enough. I'm, I'm not too far away. I live about sort of uh, you know, an hour away or so. Um, but if if I'm not using it every weekend, then it quite quickly tends to foul up or you know doesn't doesn't get looked after and maintained in the way I want it to. So I tend not to put it in till around about beginning of May. Use it for as much as I can, and then tuck it away again in sort of October or so, just when the weather starts to turn. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Nick, what about you? How is Smugglers Blues too? Um, well, like Hugo, I've not seen much of the poor old ship uh, recently, but I understand that there are uh, my friend Dave from Coastal Marine Services looks after a lot of it for me, and he uh, I saw a photograph of it, funny enough, on Instagram yesterday. <laughs> it's looking very shiny. He's been polishing it, uh, so it's getting a full cut back and polish and wax. Uh, he's anti fouling it, I think, today. Um, the engine was serviced when it came out of the water. Dart Haven do that, and I had that done as it comes out, so it sits through the winter with fresh oil. Mm. And, and the coolant uh, has got uh, sufficient antifreeze and so on. So that's all done, and it's launching next week. So all oh, very brilliant. exciting. Yes, yeah. I'm sure. So do you do that at the end of the season, Nick, or do you do your sort of winterizing and servicing at the big at, at the at the beginning of the new season, end of the last season or beginning of new? Always at the end. So as the boat comes out, in a perfect world, it would come out and be serviced whilst it's still warm, but that doesn't inevitably tend to happen. But within a day or two of it coming out, fully serviced, winterized um heater goes in the engine space another heater goes into the cabin on a thermostat uh, dehumidifier goes into the cabin keeps everything dry and warm uh, and, and that drains into the sink um and that kind of keeps it all all pretty good really but i do think it's worth changing it the oil as the boat comes out because it sits then with fresh oil with all its you know fresh inhibitors and all the stuff the good stuff that fresh oil has um, and again, the coolant as well, you know, they obviously check the, the antifreeze levels in the coolant and that's topped up and so forth. So 
I just think it's good practice. And also there's one other reason, which is you don't suddenly find yourself a week before a launch going, oh my God, I haven't serviced the boat. And then everybody going, oh, we're really busy at the minute because everyone wants their boat launched. You know, So there's that element to it as well. It's good that to is in, you know. much the most important reason and exactly why I'm with you. I do, I do get it all serviced, ready to go. So that come the start of the fresh season, just chuck it in the water, fingers crossed it starts the first time and you're away. There's no having to wait for a queue of, 15 other people who are equally keen to get their boat going but haven't thought to get it serviced until now. Yeah, exactly. that's good. That's very good advice, especially at the moment, I think, because there has been a flood of, you know, the usual cough of people who own their boats. And I think we've had a lot of new boaters um, over the last year as well. So I think engineers, mechanics, um, the dealers who are commissioning these things are extremely busy. So, yeah, sound advice, gents. What about you, Jack? You must have a boat tucked away. Well, well it's an interesting story at the moment because... Um, we're, my, my parents have got a Beneteau Swift Trawler um, in Portugal, a uh, Swift Trawler 34, and we've got a Geno Cap Camera 65 that we keep down in Sandbanks um, at the same yard as Hugo's. Um, that's not a 65 uh, footer, is it? No, 625. That's a 6.2 meter. Yeah. I heard 65. I thought, crikey, he's upgraded. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a little fella. However, both are actually on the market at the moment. Um, the Swift Trawler is on its way back to the UK. Um, it's being loaded on um, a truck next week, I think, um, because uh, between the uncertainties of, of the virus and uh, also what it could mean for um, non-EU boats um, outside of the UK next year, there's just a bit too much uncertainty, really, and it's feeling a bit uh, a bit stressful and I think whatever happens, it's not going to be quite as easy um, and relaxing as it, as it was um, before everything happened. So I think while um, the market seems pretty good and there there's, seems to be plenty of people wanting that sort of boat, um, it feels like a good time to to bring it back and uh, and put it on the market. So it's 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 quite sad. Um, we're doing it with a heavy heart because um, we love the boat and we love having it out there. But it was becoming um, feeling a bit more like more trouble than it's worth. Um, so she's on the way back. And because of that, we're obviously focusing on doing more UK boating. So we thought if that's going to be the case, let's change the cap camera app for something maybe slightly bigger and a bit more capable because we'll probably want to go a bit further afield. It's been perfect for pool, pottering around the harbour and going out to Studland, paddleboarding off, that sort of thing. But um, we've we last week picked up our, our new boat, which is an XO250, which will hopefully mean that we can get over to the Isle of Wight, cross the channel if the weather's okay. Um, you know, it's it's one of the most capable 25 foot holes on the, on the market. So even though it's not that much bigger than the Geno, um, it will hopefully mean that we can go a bit further afield and it's newer and it's got a few more toys and it's just a bit more comfortable also for doing that that local stuff. So there's a lot going on. It's been a, it's been a crazy month, um, but very exciting. And uh, yeah, hopefully the timing is great to have a new boat for, for the new season as long as things ease off as um, as it looks like they might do. That's a cracking boat. I, funnily enough, I've taken one of those 25s from Poole to the Isle of Wight for lunch at the hut. So I'm sure if you know, yeah. know the hut restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, it was just an absolute dream because it, it, that hull is so capable. It cuts through anything. Uh, I think mine had suspension seats as well. So it just, oh, it was absolute bliss. Got yeah, there in... I mean, I, I intend to do a separate video on the boat. I think we're all going to do, you know, an our, our boats video and, and show show the viewers around our boats. I know Nick, I mean, you've already done that for your channel, um, and we can direct people that way. But you know, we'll I'll do the same on the on the XO because um, it's a great spec, and the the the, the previous owner was absolutely fastidious in the in the maintenance. Um, it's almost best than new because he's done all the little things. He's for all the foibles that when you live with the boat, you find. He has rectified. Um, you really couldn't have wished for a better um, person to buy a boat from secondhand. And it's a great spec. It's got the 300 horse um, uh, Mercury Pro and you know pretty much every optional extra that you could put on it. So there were so few boats on the market. Um, we really struggled to find something that this just popped up and seemed to, to tick every box. So we haven't even launched it yet. And uh, really looking forward to getting it out in the water to, to see what it can do. Super envious. I think that'll be cracking for down there. Yeah, yeah, it should be. Um, so that's where we all are now, boating wise. But the point of this was to explain how it was we fell in love with boating and, uh, and our stories of um, of getting into the sport, hobby, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, we all do it uh, for a living uh, as well, but um, no doubt started as sort of personal passion. So, um, Nick, why don't you explain um, what it is that you love so much about boats and, and how you got into it in, in the first place? 
Uh, my love of boating started at a very early age, and I don't know where it really came from. Um, and my father had a mirror dinghy in the garage, which he'd made himself. It was a um, the mirror dinghy was something that the mirror group introduced in the mirror newspapers back in the 60s as a way of getting, um, if you like, more ordinary people onto the water. And you bought a bought this thing in kit form uh, out of out of plywood and glued it and sewed it together. Um, and uh, and he'd done this before I was born. And this thing was languishing in the garage. And I used to badger him ceaselessly to launch it, which he never actually did. He obviously used it in in the past. Um, but he did eventually buy a Draskum lugger, which is a right. more suitable family boat. Oh, so, mighty uh, beast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but of course, um, a, a chap I know called David Pyle sailed a Draskum lugger to, to Australia. And there's a video about that on Aquaholic, which is absolutely incredible. It's an open boat, 16 foot. Um, and uh, so anyway, he bought this Draskum lugger and, and we used to use that a bit. Uh, and then he had a Hurley 22 sailing boat, uh, which is 22 foot long. It uh, doesn't have a separate toilet doesn't have separate cabin, doesn't have standing headroom, and we used to spend a fortnight on that thing. <laughs> and a dog. My God. Each summer, plodding down the coast, it would do five knots on a really good day. Um, and we used to we used to take that thing all the way down to sort of ferry. I think we even got to Falmouth once and back again, and that, that was that was sort of the summer holidays. Um, was that just with your dad, or was there a... No, no, the whole, all of us, the whole family. So myself, my mother, my sister, myself, and the dog. Uh, on this 22 foot boat for two weeks. I mean, it boggles the mind now that we used to do this. Um, of course, I used to love it. I think my sister was less keen. Um, yeah, <laughs> how much did you convince born. your mum? Well, I, I, I just, I'm a, clearly a very obliging lady. Um, <laughs> Something yeah, like that. It's, it's amazing. Looking back, it is amazing. That, that yeah. It's also amazing it didn't put me off, off boats altogether, actually, <laughs> now I think about it. Um, but no, I, I've always, always been uh, fascinated by boats, used to uh, go to boat shows um, and, uh, and that was, was an eye-opener. I remember being at the London Boat Show, the two things I remember about the London, uh, going to the London Boat Show when I was very young, my father would take me, uh, and uh, I remember um, there being a Reva, I think it was a 43, and it was a quarter of a million pounds and people were just absolutely blown away that there could be even a boat for a quarter of a million pounds. It was just completely off the scale, this thing. It was, you know, we were always talking in hushed whispers about it. And I also remember, and I must have been pretty young, um, my father back at, back at the time uh, worked for a company that owned, amongst other things, a little company down in Plymouth called Marine Projects. Um, which is now Princess Yachts, and they had just brought out the Princess 37, and I remember seeing that at the boat show, and everybody walking around, oh, it's a ship, it's a ship, it's not a boat, it's a ship, you know. And I also remember that they put, it had twin shaft drive diesel mermaid engines, and they put, of course they're under the saloon floor, and to show them off, they put a glass floor, which of course the glass was probably about this thick, but I remember as a child sort of, you know, yeah. <laughs> terrified the glass floor was gonna break as I walked over it. So um, yeah, so that's kind of where, where it started. Um, it's a real overriding passion for boats and um, and when I was 20 I saw a job advertised as a yacht broker, a trainee yacht broker and applied for that and got it and and so was able to sort of combine my love of boats for uh, with work and, and the rest as they say as far as the career goes is history but the first boat that I actually owned of my own was when I was working as a yacht broker I've been there a few years we'd sold a boat second-hand boat it was about two years old it was I think a Princess 460 and it had an Avon rib on the bathing platform, a little 280 with a eight horsepower yeah it was an eight horsepower Mercury two-stroke outboard on the back of it and when the guy bought this boat it was absolutely immaculate um, but the guy who'd owned it had taken this rib off of his previous boat so it was older than the Princess it was a few years old and so he decided to update the rib with a brand new one and he said, do you know anybody wants to buy a rib? Because, you know, and I said, well, uh, you know, maybe I'll buy it. I bought this ribbon outboard off him for not very much money. I don't know, 500 quid or something like that. And it was perfectly good. It was, you know, it was a bit old, but it was, there's nothing at all wrong with it. And I used to keep that uh, and put it on the roof of my car in an Audi A3. And two of us could lift that on the roof, put the outboard in the boot, drive down to, normally to the River Dart, chuck this thing in the water, bolt the outboard on the back. 800 quid it cost. I remember now it was 800. Um, we chuck this thing in the water, put the outboard on the back, start it up, and go off and have a take a picnic, go up the river, stick it on a beach. We had some fantastic fun with that boat. It was the best 800 quid you could ever possibly sort of, sort of hope to spend, really. And I had that for a couple of years. Um, and when I sold it, I think I got 800 quid back for it. I mean, so it really cost nothing at all, effectively. It was, it was fantastic. And it was a really good way, actually, 
you know, people often say about boating a rich man's sport and all that kind of thing and of course it, it absolutely can be but it doesn't have to be and you really can go in at any level it's something that i i say a lot on my channel a lot of what i like to do with my channel is encourage people that this is not a rich man's sport um necessarily um and there's a saying that somebody said to me once and then stuck in my mind which is if you're floating you're boating and it's absolutely true you get yourself a boat get yourself on the water and we went up the river dart on that little avon we were going up the same bit of river having the same views and the same everything else as the guy on a on a 60 foot princess okay you may not have had the comfort and the ice maker and the you know everything else that he's got but we're doing the same thing on the same bit of water please tell me that you've never got the smell of two-stroke petrol at the back of your Audi a3 though <laughs> that's exactly right if you have a petrol boat and also my, my second boat was a monterey um uh, which had a V8 petrol engine. And of course, I used to do the thing where you take the fuel cans and you go up to the petrol station and you fill the fuel cans up, which you can't do anymore, or not, not to the same level. And then you drive back and you'd siphon the damn thing into the fuel and you come back again because it's so much cheaper to fill up. And, and what you say is absolutely right. You will never, ever get the smell of petrol out of your car. It's just, just you know, you're you basically. Out, you, you, you get in somebody's car and you go, hmm, petrol, you're a boater, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you definitely don't want to be smoking with 50 gallons of four star sloshing about in the back of your entry do you at that point? <laughs> four star now you, you remember the days of four star no. i remember five star. Five, I remember star five star yeah 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 my dad had a hillman hunter gls which had a 1725 holby holby holly or i think or holby or something engine uh twin headlights the ross star wheels and that took five star petrol gentlemen you can see jack uh, has absolutely no I was, idea i was, was going to say fascinating is this uh, mosey down memory lane is uh, i feel like we're getting on. Off, we're going off on a tangent a little bit um so maybe um thanks for, thank you nick we'll uh, head over to hugo and um he, you can explain um your pathway into voting yeah sure uh, i i was one of those uh kids lucky enough to grow up in a, a boating family i had a sort of huge ex extended family of my grandfather had uh, eight children in total of my father was the only boy and they all used to cram down to well sandbanks the same place i still go to um so i was born in july and within a week of being born i was down in sandbanks and going out on on my grandfather's boat i don't know if you can see it at all but i brought along a few pictures oh fantastic <laughs> I'll, wow. I'll, I'll send them to you you might be able to see him but yeah I'll, yeah uh, send them over i'll cut them in that's, that's my my grandfather's boat there and we all used to sort of pile onto it and that's me sitting on the foredeck way back when you haven't changed um, a bit and uh, that, no, tea, that, at all. that tea tray they mounted in was that your first boat i'll tell you what it wasn't dissimilar i'll tell you about my first boat in a minute but you, but you, can, you can see my second one up there a beauty of a sea yeah, ray up uh, there nice lovely lovely thing the thing that really did it for me was actually a, a, one of my aunts a, a maiden aunt an amazing character very big lady um I, i've no no idea exactly how big but what i can tell you is that she was able to sit on her back in the water and read a newspaper without swimming without a, a, a newspaper <laughs> she was literally just bob like a walrus reading this newspaper daily express always obviously far the best power boating but uh, she uh, had a wonderful speedboat called uh, an albatross it's a british built aluminium classic speedboat with a coventry climax engine and it's a very sort of light slim little thing and she used to go off um, skiing with my dad and my dad was an absolute rake of a man so this boat would sort of drive along at a horrible <laughs> angle with her sitting in the sort of steering on the, at the helm and my father on the other side and uh, they go off skiing together and in fact right behind me i don't know if you can see this but that is my dad's mono ski can you see that beauty yeah that's fantastic wow. oh it's a thing of beauty and it, uh, anyway it just to me was the coolest thing ever to see your dad on a mono ski behind this beautiful aluminium speedboat and very occasionally if we were very lucky we'd be allowed to uh, sit in the back of the speedboat and from that moment on i was just completely hooked it was such a cool thing they'd be whizzing along in that engine roaring away at the back spray coming off and you'd be back from studland in 10 minutes whereas you know the rest of them were all making their way back in uh, whatever it was a mirror sailing dinghy or we had toppers at the time um 
and to be able to get back in 10 minutes and all that fun it was just just too good to be true so uh, I you know from then on I was hooked and as soon as I was able to in fact funnily enough when when my grandfather died he left a little bit of money to all of his grandchildren and between me and my three brothers we pulled that together and uh, went off to try and buy our first boat which really we had absolutely no idea what we were doing and I, I wish I'd had the sense to actually read a few magazines like motorboat yachting first but we were, you know the the imp, imp, well, I can't even say it now, the impetuosity of youth, you kind of think you know what you're doing and you decide, OK, well, let's pool our money. We can go and see what we can find and search through the classified pages of the newspapers. Remember them? Yeah, way before yeah. the internet. And obviously it had to be a local newspaper because we didn't want to be travelling too far and eventually stumbled across Fletcher Arrow Flight 14, which back in the day was the thing to have. I mean, it was a little bit like everybody growing up, you know, the first car was a some rusty old mini. The first boat, if you had a, a couple of quid to rub together, was inevitably a Fletcher, you know, British built, classic little speedboat. Seemed huge at the time, is it? But, you know, 14 feet now, I don't even know, you can barely buy a 14 foot speedboat, I would think now, but seemed magnificent with a, a Mariner, 60 horsepower, two stroke outboard on the back. With electric tilt and trim i mean that was the wow. latest technology back then uh, oh yeah it was the color of something that comes out the back end of a dog normally it was absolutely <laughs> terrible sort of and not a very well dog at that point <laughs> it <was kind> of, <laughs> I, I can't even describe it but most get, of it was so scratched and faded you could bet I, i'll see if i can i'm not sure i've got a picture of that boat but i have seen one similar actually i'll see if i can dig one up but at the time, obviously, we just thought it was the bee's knees and instantly every girl within 100 miles would come running for a, a spin out in the boat. Never quite seemed to happen. I think they clearly saw through both us and the boat. But at the time, the four of us, it, we, we just had so much fun on that boat, learning how to ski together and mm. going out on our own. And oh, honestly, such good memories of that. And it never lost it since you know the magic is still there every time I go out on a boat i just don't know it just feels so free and relaxed and it's just that combination of having to to really focus on the moment you know all, all your little worries your concerns your everyday life is gone it's just you out on the water in that moment with your family with your mates uh, it's just just something that i will always live for i just can't ever shake it nothing matches it for me no there is nothing quite like it and it doesn't matter if you're going out to the beach or going on a long cruise or just sitting on it and fiddling with stuff um as yeah. you say, all you're focused on is that and um and it, all, all all of life's other way we sort of seem to drift away it's um it's a wonderfully relaxing pastime whatever you're whatever you're doing what's your story jack where how did you get into well it, it was um through my father and he, well, I think he regrets not maybe being quite as enthusiastic about his father's boat. There's a good reason for that, though, because it was an Orkney longliner with a Seagull engine. Um, oh. And it was small, unreliable, but he absolutely loved it. And he took it all over the place. They tow it um, all around the country and they go fishing. Um, and my grandfather was a keen sailor. He actually ran a charnery in Ramsgate for, for many years, which eventually, eventually went bust. But I think that was because he spent most of his time goosing my uncle with the hoover as they moved around the uh, moved around cleaning the shop and he was a little distracted too distracted doing that to actually run the place um but no quite a character and, and just love the sea and um i remember my dad saying to me when i was about six um you know we, we we think we might buy a boat and i grew up in the midlands so when he said that i thought he meant a narrow boat i thought we were going out on the canals and i was very excited about that but then we went down to Solcombe and it was a white shark um with a 115 horsepower very unreliable evan rude outboard uh, but at the time, I mean, this just blew my mind. I just, I didn't know boats like that existed. Um, I really had absolutely no idea that you could buy boats like that. Um, anyway, we bit the bullet and um, moored it in Sultans. And um, it lived in pool for a few years. And the, the first time um, we didn't even take it out. Actually, we just went down for the launch and dad and his friend Jerry um, took it out of Sultans and sort of wobbled across Pool Harbour. And the guy who ran the charnery there came to us and said, do they know what they're doing? And we all said in unison, no, as they just went straight across both channels. Clearly had absolutely no idea where they were going, how to use the boat, but you know, that's the learning curve. Um, and uh, we had a hell of a lot of fun 
on that boat, um, towed it to France and, and, and all sorts and, and really sort of learned the ropes. And then sort of slowly worked up to uh, a Cobra rib. Um, we had after that when I was about 14 and um, I began driving that on my own. And I remember taking my uh, mum and sister out to watch the, the Red Arrows um, and, and dad wasn't on board. So it's this amazing sort of excited, nervous moment of real pride to be in control of the boat, you know, captain the boat for the first time. And that was that was absolutely brilliant. Um, and after we you started working for us when you were about 14, John. <laughs> it was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't far after that, yeah. Um, it was a year ago. Yeah, yes. Um, and then, you know, that we really had the bug by that point. And, and, and I think Dad wanted boating to become a bigger part of our lives. So um, there's a big jump then to a Fairline Targa 40. Uh, and that really opened up, you know, our horizons. And we crossed the channel on that boat and we took it down to... The West Country, and, and you know, of course, you could live on board. So it became a huge part of our lives. Every summer was spent on board the boat, you know, as, as often as we could, um, and we loved staying. You on were board living that. in, still in. Le you were living Leicester at the time, were you? Or yes, yeah, still, still yeah. living up in, in Leicestershire. So um, yeah, we'd come down, and and you know, as soon as we finished school on a Friday, we'd be down, use the boat for the weekend, and shoot back on the Sunday. I mean, we were just completely head over and heels, head over heels with it. Um, well, that was your kind of holiday home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it was it was so much more than um, you know than than just a boat. It it really did sort of become a, a huge part of, of of the family and 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 what we we did and how we spent went spent time together. And um, we had some great moments on that boat. One I wrote about for for MBY before I joined the magazine. I, I wrote something for you, Hugo, about um, one of our experiences where we nearly crashed into some enormous rocks in the Channel Islands. And um, there was another moment where we went on Studland Bay in in Pool. A very very busy summer's day and we'd anchored the boat and gone in for a walk on the beach and we were walking back and dad said that guy either knows what he's doing or he doesn't because that boat is very close in and we realized it was our boat and the boat was <laughs> bow on to the beach and the anchor had snapped the anchor chain had snapped wow. um and we still we still to this day don't know how that happened um there was just a the link had just failed um the chair chain was dangling between the bow roller and the water bizarre anyway it came on bow on and you know this is what would it be you know 12 13 tons of boat bow on to the to the beach with a reasonable afternoon breeze pushing it on i sprinted down the beach and climbed on board and um fortunately or unfortunately the part of the beach it had drifted onto was the stud the nudist beach so <laughs> um i was having no luck getting this thing off the off the beach with the engines um but then a, a very friendly naked fisherman uh, arrived and he uh, attached naked a line. fisherman. A naked fisherman uh, got his, so got is, his... This, is this a dream that you're describing? No, uh, no, this is all 100 percent true. Um, he attached a line to the bow and then an army of very friendly, very naked people helped push the boat off the beach and got her floating again. And um I took a bow out to sea and uh, yeah, waited for the family to come on. But thank God for all the, the naked people of, of Sutherland Beach. Um, I how, think you, you took them all for a joyride, did you? That seemed like a decent <laughs> thing to do at that point. <laughs> no, there were, there were too many things that could have got caught in the propellers. I thought they'd been a bit dangerous. Oh, 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 oh dear. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, can't help thinking, I can't help thinking that story should end with, and, and, and that's how I arrived at this position, Your Honour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's a pretty extraordinary one, but I can I can swear to you, all absolutely true, and um, <laughs> you know, just part of the rich tapestry of um, of, do, of going boating. Why is it that nudists seem obsessed either by doing something that causes an awful lot of jiggling or dangerous <laughs> sports like fishing? I mean, why would you want fishing hooks anywhere near you when you're naked? That cannot no. be a good idea. No jiggling and bending over. Any anything that involves those two activities, you just seem to be a big fan of. But hey, I'm not going to rubbish them. They saved our boat, so thank you very much yeah, to definitely. to study you, you two, population. You two seem to know an awful lot more about this subject than I do. Oh, my this dad always great. used to go. Oh, my dad always used to go. It's the best holding over there, so we'll anchor off that. As he got out his giant binoculars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just went along with it, but now obviously now I can see through it all. Um, but. Hey, they helped us out on on that day. Um, I've, I've been traumatised there a few times myself. Myself yeah. walking up Dudlin Beach to Old Harry, and uh, particularly, you know, as as a young boy, you're at exactly the wrong height. You do not <laughs> want to be walking there. Yes, well, I mean, it can't just have been us who've had some boating mishaps. Any any stick out for you, chaps? Anything that's gone wrong that um, you'd like to share? Oh, I am responsible for sinking 
the family's beautiful old 70 year old launch. Um, for some reason or another, I was entrusted with looking after this boat, which is a, 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 a lovely um, Douglas fir pine on uh, oak launch that was built in the 1940s and has been in the family ever since. And every year we used to pull it out over winter and store it ashore on this whole, it was, we had a sort of strange kind of railway tracks that led down into the sea and it came up on this old cradle. And anyway, so come the new season, we used to roll it down these tracks and into the sea again and float it off. But unbeknownst to me, there's that an old boat like that made of wood takes considerable time for all the planks to, to take up and it dries out over winter. So all the sort of cracks emerge in the seams and then gradually they, as the as the wood takes up the water, it becomes watertight again. So the trick is either to fill the boat with water first for a few days, not completely, but you know, fill it up enough to, to make sure that up to the water line it's had some water in it, or to leave it on the cradle whilst it takes up. I made the fatal mistake of getting it in the water and initially it bobbed off beautifully. Said, bah, result, took it to the end of the pier, tied it up onto the pier, went away to make myself a cup of tea and congratulate myself on a job well done, came back, bang, underwater. Whole thing straight down, engine and all. Oh. I mean, it was... A, it, it wasn't in terribly deep water, it was only sort of four or five feet deep. But honestly, I mean, it, to feel, <laughs> to yeah. come back and see the boat sitting on the mud, water lapping over the engine bay. Oh, I can only and think, imagine. Oh, no. Yeah. No. yeah. You know, and it's not, it's not even just my boat. It's, you know, it belongs to all my cousins. And, oh, it was, it was a shameful moment that one I've never quite lived down. But, wow. you know, we had to get the whole engine, you know, drained and oiled and, but you kind of know that if an engine's been underwater, it's never going to be the same again. Yeah. Um, so it did last a few years. Um, and to be fair, I've put an awful lot of work into it since then, making sure that it yeah. has stayed afloat and we've had the whole thing rebuilt and uh, restored. And she's still still there to this day, still going strong. And hopefully she'll be good for another 70 years. Yeah. 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 But Nick, you can't have got away scot-free here. You must have done something wrong, had a crash, done something silly. <laughs> I did once crash a Princess 35 into a harbour wall. Oh, oh. <laughs> a brand new Princess 35 oh. into a harbour wall, um, but very, very slowly. Um, oh, and I wasn't right. actually at the helm at the time. So, you know, it wasn't really my fault. Um, no, but it, cool. I, I had started as a as this trainee yacht broker and we were, a, uh, it was a company called Talkie Marine Sales. In fact, I found her day because I've moved house recently, I discovered an original Torquay Marine Sales for Sales sign. The company doesn't oh, exist right. anymore. That's, that's all that remains of Torquay Marine Sales. Hang on, I'm just making a call to that number, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll find anybody's there. Um, anyway, so I'd started there as, as a very enthusiastic yacht broker and, um, or trainee yacht broker, and, and part of my executive uh, tasks was to clean the stock boats. Um, and I had, they'd been giving me a little bit of instruction on handling these boats and I was starting to get to grips with it. And I was cleaning a Princess 35, um, cleaned all the one side, across the front of the house. I thought, well, I'll turn it around, good excuse to have a little go. I'll turn it around and, and, and put it, put the fenders across the other side, bring it back in, I can clean the other side. So I, I fired this thing up, moved it off. It was flat calm, um, nothing much moving. Stopped the boat sort of just off the pontoon and uh, yeah, nobody around, everything's fine. Boat sat there quite still, untying the fender, moved it across, and another, moved it across. And after about four of these, I suddenly realized that the harbour wall was a lot closer than it used to be. And the, basically, the very slight breeze was pushing this boat along at about half a knot. And uh, I realized that we weren't far off impact. So I raced back down the side that. Now, with hindsight, what I should have done was gone for the lower helm. Um, but because I was young and inexperienced and, and had never driven the boat for the lower helm, I went for the flybridge. So I'm sprinting up the ladder onto the flybridge, across the flybridge, just in time to watch it impact into the wall Ooh. and uh, bend the anchor and the anchor bracket into a lovely S shape. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, you know, half a knot, you say moving at half yeah. a knot, the damage that can be done, my God. Well, it's about, I don't know what a Princess 35 weighs, about 10 ton, I guess, so you've got yeah. 10 ton of pressure that you're bringing to stop using an anchor roller. God, uh, <laughs> well, at least it wasn't the GRP in some respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We managed to get it off and get it straightened up and, and all was well. Um, there was you another still story. job at the end of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, were, they were fine. I think pretty much everybody had crashed the boat at some stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all part of the learning process, isn't it? Yeah. yeah <laughs> and on that note, um, I think, you know, possibly wrap up. 
by possibly giving over some advice to people who are thinking about getting the boat into boating, um, possibly have just bought a boat. Um, you know, if you were in their shoes, you could have your time again um, when in your early days of boating. Is there anything in particular that you would recommend? I mean, me personally, I think we did have a bit of training on that on the white shark, but I really felt like we sort of felt our way into it on our own. My advice would be to have some training on your own boat. It sounds really simple, but you may do some tuition and you could do it on the instructor's boat and that's fine. But there's nothing like being put through the, your paces on your own boat. You're learning the boat at the same time. You're also learning how to do things. And we found that really valuable. We did it with the Targa. Uh, and it's really helpful to, to be able to put that stuff in, in that you, you, you're doing in training into practice on your own boat. So that's something that we found really helpful. Anything else you guys would would suggest to people if they're if they're getting into boating for the first time? Uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you on the training front and, you know, whether that is on your own boat, if you've already bought one or if you haven't, then, you know, signing up for a powerboat level two or something with a, uh, you know, a decent school with a rib or something to get a feel for it. Um, the other thing that I, I, I really like the look of and could well have been tempted if I was starting again now would be to to join a one of these boating clubs where you don't necessarily have to commit to buying your own boat and putting in you know a big chunk of capital you can take out a membership for a year um really get a feel for it uh, the other thing I, I like about those is they tend to have fleets of slightly different boats so you don't necessarily have to commit to a sports boat or a wheelhouse boat or an open launch you know you can try various different sizes and styles of boats and get a feel for what you think is right for you because mm -hmm. i think it's very easy to to go into buying a boat with a quite a firm idea of, of what you want because you're drawn to a particular look or style but until you actually start to use it how you'd want to use it you don't really know what it is that you're looking for I think a lot of the time yeah you know and, and it's there, there's no such thing it, uh, you know, I used to work as a car journalist and it's it, it seemed like in the in the world of cars there were kind of good cars and bad cars and medium cars it really doesn't seem to work like that on boats. There are, there are just different boats that suit different people. And it's mm. entirely. It's not black and white. To your own personal mm. preference as, as to what's most important to you. And that might be the, the amount of accommodation. It might be the size of the cockpit compared to the wheelhouse. It might be the speed of the engine or how much fuel it uses. Obviously, budget is a limiting factor for nearly all of us. But precisely what that combination is and what your priorities should be varies hugely and I think that opportunity to go out and try a load of different boats for a year without a massive financial commitment is just a, a great way to build experience not just of handling a boat but also the kind of boating that appeals to you and what you should be looking for. Yeah good shout. Nick how about you? Any, any wisdom from your end? I, I just like to say, I think Hugo's advice sorry, about the boat clubs is is very good. I think um, they're a really good way. I did a feature on them for MBY um, a couple of years ago. It's the first time I really looked at them in any depth. And I do think genuinely they're a great idea. I don't think it's necessarily the sort of thing that's going to work for um, for somebody long term, you know, because for myself, for example, you know, there's, there's so much to be said for actually owning your own boat. But I think as a way into boating, I think they're absolutely brilliant. And I think for some people as well, they'll just work long term as well some people don't want the commitment of owning a specific boat they want someone else to look after it and they don't want to put the money the tie the capital up so as a way in they're brilliant and even long term i think some people would be brilliant but but it certainly means that when you do buy a boat you have a pretty good idea as hugo says as, as to what you'll need uh, my advice would be uh firstly just do it you can overthink these things and you can think and think and why should i do it why shouldn't i do it and what, what do i need and all that there's a lot to be said for just getting at anything uh, and just getting on with it. I think another advice I would give is there is a, a budget for pretty much everybody. Um, we went kayaking on a lovely little um, inland waterway in Ireland a couple of years ago on uh, inflatable kayaks that cost, I think, about £70 each. And it was we were still on the water and we were still boating. And, and you don't need, yeah, they fit in the boot of the car, obviously, and they cost virtually nothing. Um, you know, they, don't be intimidated by it being a rich man's sport because it can be, but it doesn't have to be. There is speedboats that cost a thousand pounds, and and they have just so much fun with them. So I would say that. And the other thing I think is, don't be intimidated by the fact that everybody else seems to be an expert because a they're probably not, and b even if they are, 
they weren't once. And people are generally, I, you know, I know people who get a bit overawed, they've got a boat and a marina and they're terrified to take it out because of, everybody's watching me and it's all going to go wrong and nobody else seems to do it perfectly. It goes wrong for everybody. And people generally are pretty sympathetic to the fact that, um, you know, they were there once, they were, they were new to it once. So don't be intimidated by it. Don't think, you know, I've got to be an expert before I start because everybody was a beginner once and, uh, and people are generally, it, it's a very social group. People are generally very keen to come and help. You know, you'll still see a boat coming in, especially with somebody that um, is new to it. If they see somebody coming in on a marina, they'll, they'll trot around and help, especially if their boat's alongside it. I was going to um, say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're rafting, you'll have plenty of help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so you know, I, I think don't, don't overthink it. Don't be intimidated by it. Uh, and don't feel that it's uh, an elitist or an expensive sport. It's not. It's it's for everybody, and everybody can do it. And there are all kinds of ways in boat clubs, as Hugo says, you know, kayaks, inflatable dinghies, speed boats, right up to. I know people who started with the first boat as a 40, brand new 40 foot princess. I mean, you can go in at any level, um, and you're all doing the same stuff if you're floating your boating. I think we should start yeah. a drinking game where every time you say that we do a shot, but I, I don't think we'd actually get through another video, but maybe we'll, uh, we'll consider it for the next one. Uh, we have alcoholic bingo now where people look at yeah, the yeah. phrases. That, 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 has, that has got to be one of them, but no, you know, <laughs> it's, you, uh, true, might, though. it's true. Yeah. Might have to change your name from alcoholic back to alcoholic. I think Nick it is. Right. <laughs> I think it was Jack's idea. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, you make a fine point, Nick, and that seems uh, a very good uh, good place to to wrap up. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, that that video, and I think it you know it makes the point that you know we've all made mistakes, and um, you know there's plenty of fun to be had along the way. Um, and uh, we'll be sure to do those those videos about our boats as well. Um, you know, as I said, Nick has already got one on his channel, which we'll link to, and um, Hugh and I will, will, will film will film ours ASAP and get those onto the channel. Um, guys, thanks very much again for joining me, and um, I'll see you on the next one. Will do. Bye. Nice to see you guys.